you, everybody. Welcome to Off Panel, a weekly interview podcast about all things comics, brought to you by Sketch.com. I'm your host, David Harper, and this week's guest is the writer of comics like The History of the Marvel Universe, Ignited, Kingdom Come, Impulse, and more. It's Mark Wade. Thanks for coming on, Mark. My pleasure, sir. So we're going to be talking about your more current work here in a bit, but I wanted to start by going more towards the beginning for you, as I know you took a rather indirect route to becoming a, a writer. Uh, before you started writing full-time, you were a writer and then editor for Amazing Heroes, a comics magazine at Fantagraphics, and then an editor at DC Comics. And, you know, those aren't necessarily one-for-one one in terms of overlap with the writing, but I imagine they were formative experiences in their own way. Did you find that those experiences change how you viewed storytelling and even comics themselves at all? Like were those impactful jobs for your long term, like the way you kind of thought about comics and writing? Well, the thing about the thing about working for amazing heroes and doing interviews with pros and so forth, which is again, the mag a magazine that would, you know, obviously I'm speaking to your, your listeners, 25 years old and younger. It was what we call a magazine back in the day. <laughs> um, and it was uh, that was tra- it was transformative in the sense that uh, yeah it really made these creators human to me. And you know, when you're growing up, when you're a kid, you just think of them all as you know anybody who works in comics is some sort of you know gifted you know talented god you know that uh, who you'll be lucky maybe someday and you know if you're lucky to get an autograph. And then you know, doing interviews with them and talking to them, you know, they're just they're just guys, and it sort of helped. I to prime the pump in terms of curing me of my fear that this is something that I could never do. Um, and then working on staff as an editor, uh, having all these scripts come across my desk in two years, I was working on the anthology books. I was working with every, ed- every writer there was out there. And uh, I always say that that's a, it was a boot camp. It was, I learned more in about writing in two years than I would have 10 years on my own. And I didn't really, I never set out to be a writer. I mean, I did lots of nonfiction writing, but I never considered myself to be a fiction writer. Uh, I just thought it would be too difficult. I honestly didn't think I, I couldn't imagine how you could come with, with ideas four or five times a month, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but working on these scripts and working with these writers and working in the industry on an editorial level helped me realize that, okay, maybe there's some room for me to do it here. Maybe, maybe I can knock out a story or two in my lifetime. And then I just got lucky. You know, I just, it's, it's been a, a pretty good ride ever since. Yeah. I mean, it, it is really interesting because like you described it as a boot camp, and I imagine it's a really good way to see that not everyone approaches everything the same way. Because if, if you were there in the eighties, I mean, you were seeing some really interesting voices coming in there. Like, I don't know if Alan Moore was there, but seeing one of his scripts, I imagine was, you know, like you see that and you're like, oh, well, this is a completely different animal. It's like everyone's approach is so different. So it's it's like you oh, don't. Absolutely. Yeah. No, yeah, but you... no, there's I'm sorry. Yeah, there's not there's not one single way of doing it. I mean, I, I edited Neil Gaiman early on in his career. I edited, you know, John Ostrander, Christopher Priest. I mean, you know, every single every single writer that you can think of that worked for DC and a lot of guys who work both at DC and Marvel. The other thing that editorial did to prepare me for writing is sort of make me aware that in a sense, the job of the writer is to solve problems for the editor. I mean, you know, the, the real job is to tell a story, but the secondary job is solve problems for the editor in terms of wanting, you know, wanting to get work, wanting to continue to get work. Uh, don't be difficult. You know, don't be, you know, don't be obstinate, uh, be a pro. And, and make his life as easy as it possibly can be. And that is, you know, one of the ways that you keep getting work. It doesn't mean you defer to every single whim that an editor has. And as I've also said else, elsewhere, you only have your resume. That's all you've got. So you, you can't take editorial direction for any length of time such that it will make the work worse mm-hmm. because, you know, you might be branded difficult if you push back on an editor, but at the same time, you know, it, being branded difficult is being better than branded, no talent, you know, right. being branded, uh, you know, uh, a hack because the work that comes out under your name is crap. So you, you can't have that happen. You've got to, you've got to be violently protective of your work. Yeah. I, th- I think it's really funny. Um, 
uh, one of the things I've noticed about creators who have worked in editorial in some capacity is that quite often, I wouldn't say every single one of them, but they they're often some of the most schedule oriented creators I ever find where it's like they they yeah. they know what that world is like and so like okay I can't do this to an editor I don't know if it's just that or if it's maybe just like your brain has been rewired to work like that it certainly you, you get a big picture I mean you, you get a much bigger macro view of how the whole system works and I think that you know it, it's the same as you know you're always going to tip better if you ever worked as a waiter or a waitress mm-hmm yeah, I, I, you know, one of the things I thought was really interesting when I was researching this was, you know, I, I've, I, the first thing I ever read from you was uh, when I was a kid, I came across a, an early trade paperback for the Flash Terminal Velocity, and it was like this huge moment for me where I was like, oh my god, Bart Allen is me. It's like this is this is character for me, and so I always only knew you as a writer. But when I was researching for this, I knew you had, I knew you had done editing, but. I didn't realize, like, there was this quote that I came across from you in an interview where you said you honestly thought that your time at, as an editor at DC, that it, to the bottom of your soul, that that would be the job you'd have for the rest of your life. Why, yeah. why was that? Like, was there a part of that job that just jived with you? Like, what was it? There's, well, first off, I didn't, we get back to the idea that I didn't think I was going to be a writer. That was part of it. Uh, also, but I knew I wanted to be involved creatively. I knew I wanted to have something to do with production of the comics because I love the medium so much and I love the characters so much. Uh, so that seemed to be the, a fit for me. Also, I, I'm a problem solver. I mean, that's my, uh, I like puzzles. I like, you know, difficult situations. I like trying to figure my way out of messes. Uh, and that's, you know, that's very much an editor's job. Yeah. Uh, you know, the logistics of it appealed to me. Uh, you know, that was, that was really it. That was my intention of just being an editor for the rest of my life. I just, I was going to grow up to be, you know, I, I, I don't know, you know, I was going to grow up to be Bob Kaniger. I was going to grow up to be, you know, Murray Baltanoff. Mm-hmm. What, what, when did that change? Like what, what opened the door for writing for you? Like may, what, I guess what made you think you could do that? Well, I had done, before I went on, on staff, I did a couple of Superman stories for Julie Schwartz, a couple of very brief, like eight pagers. One of them is pretty good, and the other one is crap. Uh, but I, at least I got a sense, okay, I, I can, I can kind of do this. I'm not sure that I could do this on any kind of regular basis, but it's nice to have in my back pocket. And then while I was on staff, uh, I did a couple more stories. I did another – there was an emergency. We were doing a book called Action Comics Weekly, mm-hmm. which – is just the best named comic in the world because weekly is pretty much how everybody perceived it. Um, it, and, and it was an emergency where we suddenly had an eight page slot open and a book had to go to press like that week. And what do we do? And I'm literally standing in the office going, all right, well, I can, you know, I can knock a human target story out. Let me try that. I've always wanted to do that. And so that was another not great story, but a little more experience. And then getting to know Brian Augustine when I was there, who later ended up being my flash editor. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we were, you know, sharing an office and we were both up there at the same time at, at relatively similar positions. Uh, he was a writer. I mean, he was, he was a very creative fella and it, it was just fun talking stories back and forth with him. So we managed at some point to con Denny O'Neill into publishing a, a big long uh, Batman story that we'd written uh, for one of the annuals. And that was, I mean, the first, the first work that I did that I thought, all right, this is, you know, maybe there's something here, but again, I was still on staff. I still honestly thought that the, that if I was ever going to be writing, it'd just be kind of, you know, a side gig, a little thing on the side, but I wanted to be an editor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I do think it's funny. Like you're you're talking about how you're a problem solver. Like one of those early stories was named the puzzle of the purloined fortress. I feel like that's a very fitting title for you just because it has puzzle in it. It's like, I don't know. It's, it's on brand for you. Yeah, Paul Levitz actually pulled me aside once, and we were just talking about work, and he said, you're a puzzle writer. That's what you are. That's, uh, you know, that's, that's how you come at things. I never thought about it until he said it that way, but yeah, I do like to set myself up in situations and, and try to figure out. I mean, I've said also before, and again, I'm, I keep saying I've said this before, which means that it sounds like I'm just giving you secondhand interview material. I don't mean to. Uh, but, you know, when I write, I love writing cliffhangers to my comics and I love not having any idea what the solution to that cliffhanger is. Sure. I always write myself into a corner because I love the idea that a month from now I better figure it out 
And in the meantime, if I don't know and you can't guess, then we'll both be surprised. Yeah. Now, the question is, is have you ever written yourself into a corner you couldn't get out of? Not that I couldn't, but I have written myself into a corner that it took me an insane amount of time and effort and brain power to get out of. And that was something you haven't seen yet, actually. It's the last issue of the Invisible Woman miniseries. Oh, okay. Uh, I had just set myself up in issue one with a situation that I honestly thought I could pay out in issue five. And when I got there, there was there I could find no way to do it until the last second. I mean, I might edit my editor, Tom Brevoort patiently waited a few extra days for that script because I was just banging my head on the wall. But by and large, by and large, I'm able to get my way out of it. Mm -hmm. No. So I'm interested about, you know, this, this puzzle type element, the problem solving type element, because I, I think one of the interesting things about you is that you are kind of perceived as this writer who has like an encyclopedic knowledge of comics like Marvel and DC, but particularly DC, I would say. Do you find that maybe part of the reason I, you, it sounds like you're generally a, a problem solver, like a puzzle solver, not just as a writer, but do you find that part of the reason why that appeals to you is because maybe you understand these characters and where they came from to a certain degree. And so you're trying to find challenges for you outside of just character based ones. I think that's well observed and something that nobody ever pointed out before. That's I never thought about that, but I think that has a lot to do with it, that I'm looking for clever ways of doing things with these characters that we have not seen before and, and always looking for that moment, that little character bit or that little bit with their equipment or what can you do with Captain America shield you've never done before, that kind of stuff. Um, that's a puzzle to me. And that's, I'm always looking for that because I've read a hundred thousand comic books right? and I, I've, you know, and I've written like 2000 and I, uh, kind of long past a point where the challenge is, gee, how will Spider-Man fight Walter? Yeah. I don't really care. I don't really care anymore. That's the easy part. It's just, you know, what makes it interesting to me? I've written that before. There's no, I can't, there's no variation of superhero story or conflict or resolution or anything that I have not written at some point in my life at this point. So I'm desperately clawing for new material like that all the time. And I find it within the characters. Yeah, I, one of the things that I came across in an interview that you did, that you had done recently was you talked about how you had the 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 narration device that you used for the first arc of Doctor Strange was almost just like a challenge to yourself because you wanted to see if you could. Use, I'm trying to remember what it was. It was third person. It was yeah. It was it was th it was third person, but a little more florid. Yeah, than standard third person. Um, and yeah, I took it on because I thought that'd be an interesting challenge to do that and. Um, guess what? I, I couldn't do it. <laughs> Just, surprise. I couldn't do it. Um, luckily I was able to transition out of it pretty easily. Uh, just because I decided that this whole story was being told by a character who wasn't even existing in my head when I wrote the first issue Yeah, and it played off fairly nicely. But yeah, my, my problem, my continual problem, not only in the industry, not only as a writer, but also just basically as a human being is I really have a difficult time distinct, making the distinction between uh, challenges and death traps. <laughs> sure, sure. As long as it doesn't manifest itself and, in a and, physical space, you're probably good. Right. But it is just constantly, constantly taking things on because I think that's an interesting challenge. And then I will realize, oh, my God, no, 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 it's not an interesting challenge. It's a, it's a you know. It's a complete death trap. I'm doomed. Um, but I'd rather be that way than play it safe. I mean, I'll never learn anything any other way. Yeah. The funny thing about the Doctor Strange stuff, though, is is like I I I I bought that first issue and I found it to be deeply interesting because I'd never read a comic that was narrated like that. And I was just I was reading it and I was just like, this is first off, it was completely unlike anything I'd ever read from you. And second off, I was like, I don't know if I've ever read a comic with narration like this. And the funny Thank thing, the, the funny thing about it is, is like, 
it, that that slightly this is like the magic of storytelling because as an outsider you see these things and you're like oh he totally had this planned out you know the fifth issue right. is going to be revealed that doctor strange isn't actually doctor strange or like the person who's in the sanctum sanctorum isn't actually doctor strange and i'm like wow he had this planned out really well but it, this was this was all the the puzzle box this is you finding a solution yeah, to your the, narrative yeah. problem yeah it was all ad hoc although i, I will say this Grant Morrison and I were talking once about this very thing. And Grant has a theory that I like, which is that by now we know enough about storytelling where whether we realize it or not, we're leaving breadcrumbs behind us. Mm -hmm. And, and if we are wise and if we are, you know, open-minded about how to tell a story, we can look back on our own work a lot of times. And, and I'm not entirely sure that's a coincidence that that, opportunity was left for me that I had, I'd left myself that out at some point. I think, you know, there's a really strong chance that some of that stuff you just put down subconsciously without realizing that you're laying breadcrumbs, if that analogy makes sense. Sure. And then you go back and holy shit, this stuff actually does fit together. And you know, if, if I do it, if I do it right, you never notice. If I do it right, I get the beauty of you coming back and <laughs> going, wow, I didn't see that coming. You really plan that out. Yeah. No, I didn't plan it out. <laughs> well, you could have fooled me, Mark. Uh, you, you know, Thank you. Is, is, that, is that part of the appeal, like the puzzle box thing, part of the appeal for, you know, like the history of Marvel Universe, which is, is a, a book you're working on right now. Uh, fifth issue comes out the day after this drops, or the, the day after we're, we're chatting. And, it, you know, that is a really interesting series because – it doesn't really have character to it. It doesn't, you know, honestly, like, I mean, it has narrative in the sense that it's telling the history of the Marvel universe, but it seems like a story that's very unlike most of what Marvel has ever published before. Does the appeal for a project like that stem less from like the history element and more from how am I going to do this? You're in my head man. you're freaking me out. You're in my head. (laughs) Um, Yeah, that's, that's very true. I mean, it wasn't just, you know, hey, I, 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 you know, I didn't come to the, I didn't come to the table and say, hey, I really want to do history of the Marvel Universe. You know, Tom Brevoort called me up and said, here's an outline. You know, here's some beats. You know, here's basically at first it was here's a page by page outline of what we should cover. And I thought, okay, well, what can I do with this to make it not a 120 page Wikipedia entry? What can I do to make this a little more interesting to me? And that was the challenge. If it were just a matter of sitting down and writing out 120 pages of Wikipedia, that's no challenge. And that's not interesting to me. Uh, but I will say that, you know, as draining as it is, you know, spending an entire day, and I mean, an entire day trying to figure out how to synopsize, uh, Jonathan Hickman's secret wars into two pages, <laughs> an entire day. Yeah. I'm banging my head on the wall, but at the same time, when I'm done, a real sense of accomplishment to this. Like it's a, pro- it's a puzzle I solved and I feel like it came together and that becomes addictive. So it's, it becomes like, okay, well, what's, wait, what's the next page? What's the next thing? Oh, more of the gods. Okay. You know, or more of the realms, whether I like, okay, I can, I, I can do this. And it becomes, you know, a lot more fun than it, than it looks like at first because it looks so daunting. Yeah. I think that I do want to say that, uh, I think one thing that seems to, and, and maybe I'm just reading too much into this, but it's like, the Franklin Galactus relationship in that book seems like it almost unlocked something for you. It's like you needed that to make it more than just that Wikipedia entry. Yep. First thing I said to Tom Brevoort, I said, I just, I can't do this straight up like this. I need a narrative hook. I need there to be some, some emotion, some conflict, something with some surprise to it. Um, and, you know, Tom always backed my plays, God bless him. Uh, so that was, that was what made it work. Mm-hmm. And thank you. I'm glad that I'm glad that pulls it together for you. I'm really happy with the way it's come out in issue six, which I just saw uh, ready to go to press tomorrow, I guess. So it uh, I think it comes together. Yeah, I uh, I'm, I'm doing an interview with Javier Rodriguez about it right now. And I'm pretty sure if it's off to press that he's going to be asleep for the next month then. Oh, yeah. He's the best. Let me just point out. He is the best. He out George Perez, George Perez. <laughs> And no matter what I gave him, he would want more and he would put in more and I would, it would be insane. I mean, those, the composition of those pages and the way he uses design as a storytelling tool, um, that there's a, there's a page in issue three, which is the Spider-Man page, the origin of the Spider-Man page, 
where he uses like the webbing on Spider-Man's boots to act as panel borders and tells the story that way within that panel border space. Genius. I never would have thought of that. You're so good, Avi. And he's fast and he's reliable and he's conscientious and he doesn't push back. And, you know, if I were him, I'd be taking an ax to my head at this point because I, of what I've put him through. But instead, he's just genial and like, give me more. He's the best. Yeah, and he's also got a style that's sort of, it's almost like Ditko John Romita modernized. It's its like, it's from that kind of school, and the, when you combine that with his storytelling and the fact that he, he can design pages like he does, I, you know, you can say this about, you know, some books, but you can't say it very often in total truthfulness. I don't know who else could have drawn this book. No, I don't either. I don't either. It's it, There's a cleanliness of line to him, there's a cleanness of line, there's a there's a, you know, again, a design sensibility that is unlike anybody else working out there. I mean, yeah, nobody else could have done this. Yeah. Well, I, I want to go back uh, just because I would be extremely mad at myself if I didn't ask you a little bit about Impulse. But, you know, I, I, I mentioned that it was the first thing I'd ever, you know, Thermal Velocity was the first thing I ever read and then jumping into Impulse. It, the funny thing is, is that was one of my earliest experiences with your work. And I was like, oh, this Mark Wade guy is amazing. And then I realized that apparently that was very early on for you as well, which was really astonishing. Yeah. But, but when I was reading an, an interview with you, you said that that was one of the your favorite the impulse was one of your favorite things you'd ever wrote. What was it that you love so much about it? Because it was a super meaningful series for me. What I love was the ability to do humor and heart at the same time. And, and I hadn't really had that chance yet. I mean, there's always a little bit of humor in flash. There was always a little bit of humor in justice league or whatever. But I mean, with impulse, I could go straight up comedy with, there wasn't a place for that outside of like Archie comics in the entire medium. And that really plays to my strengths and being, having the latitude to make it about heart as well. And really, you know, make the relationship between Bart and Max Mercury something that I felt was pretty deep and pretty significant. Uh, I got some nice moments out of that. I really do. I think I got some really nice heart, you know, heartbreaking moments out of that series. Yeah. In no small part because of Umberto Ramos, who, again, brought the thunder every month. That guy, cheese. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I met him at Orlando MegaCon at the peak of my fandom for for that book. I think it was like must've been 1997 or something like that. And I was I was young and he did a sketch for me on a on a, a backer and it was Bart with his gigantic hair, the hair that was like a character unto itself. And oh, I yeah. I the still have that to this day. They were like the size of gunboats, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, 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 no. I mean that 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 was it. I mean it's just like it, it there was there was something I don't know what it was about Humberto's art that just jived perfectly with Impulse, but it was yeah. just like the the kind of manga influences that had like the big hair and the big feet. There was just it just per it was perfect. But I do think yeah. What? Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say without Humberto, we would have been canceled by issue six. I'm <laughs> I'm convinced of this. But go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say I do think one of the funny things about Impulse, though, when you when you look back on it, is like you wrote that character. Because he was he was raised in VR and he was basically looked at life like a video game. And honestly, like maybe Bart Allen, Bart Allen might have been the most prescient character of the 1990s. He's sort of reflective of you know what the world is like today to a certain degree, where we're you know permanently engaged with devices and and everything like that. I just think it's really funny because. At the time, I was just like, oh, this is so funny. He looks at life like a video game, and he just like kind of looks at life in a slightly different way than other people because of the way he's raised. And now it's almost, what, 20-plus years later, and that is kind of where we're at. That's kind of how the world works, exactly. That, that we, you know, we are so hooked to our screens morning, noon, and night that, it, yeah, exactly. I mean, I didn't do that on purpose, but... Gosh, I'm smart. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a, if if you actually did that on purpose, knowing that's the way it would go. I'm pretty sure you should have actually been, uh, you know, buying stocks instead of writing comic books. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, I, I mentioned earlier about the fact that you're known as is a, is a history guy, and like I, I feel like that's one of like two things that people really know you for. With the other one being that you tend to write young characters quite a bit between Impulse, Archie, Champions, and now Ignited. 
I think that that's a really interesting pair of things to be known for because it seems in a way there's like a dissonance between those ideas. There's like the new and the old. But for you, do you find that there's like that there's a connection between knowing one and excelling at the other? It's like you have to know where you came from to tell the next generation's story in a way. I'm going to say yes. I don't, I never, I'm joking. I honestly have never thought about it, but that's not a bad supposition. I never really thought about it. I just thought that it's, I'm not sure quite what the appeal of writing younger characters is for me, other than um, there's, it seems like there's more chance for humor because things are just a little less, I mean, ignited aside, you know, things are a little less dire and uh, serious in the life of a teenager than they maybe as an adult. Um, there's also, I like playing with relationships. I like the fluidity of, of teenage relationships and how things can turn on a dime with these care with these kids, uh, no matter what, whether I'm writing the Legion or whether I'm writing Archie, or whether I'm writing the United kids, it's, you know, everybody's hormones are working 110% and everything is grand opera all the time. And that's kind of fun to write. Yeah. I think that, you know, this, this is me trying to get in your head again, Mark, but, um, I feel like. I feel like part of the reason that you're good with young people is I always find that you're very good at writing family and, you know, you, you know, you have impulse and like his relationship with Max Mercury is just fantastic. But even, you know, you, you did that run, run on Fantastic Four with Michael Ringo, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that you've done in your career even in a weird way, Kingdom Come. I mean, like Kingdom Come, like a lot of it was about the connection between these characters and the multi-generational thing. A lot of it feels like deep down it's it's about familial relationships. And may, I don't know. I mean, like that, that just feels like something that maybe unifies those two sides, that, that knowledge of history, but also the affinity for writing younger characters. And yet, paradoxically, I left home, you know, when I was 15, 16 years old, um, never looked back, not close to my family. Sure. Uh, never had been. Um, and, you know, I'm not, I've really not ever been seeking out a family. I have no kids, you know, not married. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know whether, I, you know, if you're going to put your, your psychoanalytic hat on, I mean, there's probably every opportunity, probably every chance that I'm just writing something that I, on some level I want or some sure. level that I miss out of my life. Uh, I don't really, I don't think about it that way, but there's, there's something to be said by that. I mean, or working vicariously through these characters to find a family that I've never really been. And again, they're fine people, by the way. I'm not trying to say that my family were monsters. It's just sure. my own predilection. I just, I was never close. Mm -hmm. Never am close. Still am not close. So maybe there's something there. Maybe that's what I'm I'm doing as I'm acting out. Hmm. I don't know. But, I don't know. But related to all this, I think that, you know, one of the things I was recently, I do these mailbags for my site where my uh, subscribers to my site will ask me questions. And somebody was talking about continuity. And it, it's it's like one of these interesting things about how like there's so much, you know, a, a lot of people I feel like treat, a, a lot of people treat continuity as if it's almost like a checklist rather than it's like basically the you know story of our lives. And, and and I think it's really interesting because, you know, you are this person who knows a lot about comic book history, but it doesn't ever really feel like you are trying to do that checklist route. Like, you're not just trying to make sure that this character's relationship matches this issue from 1976. You're trying to tell the right story for the character. So what, is, what does continuity mean to you in that context? And, like, how do you believe it should be used? It's a, it's a tool. I mean, it's a, it's a tool like a lot of other things. I mean, the, the, the problem with continuity becomes when you're using it as a spine to something rather than just another tool that you're using to help tell the story. Um, there's a huge difference between continuity and consistency. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, The Simpsons has no real continuity. I mean, my God, there's an idle head in the basement sometimes, and sometimes there's not. You know, Homer's had more jobs than anybody in the world could possibly have. But there's consistency. You know who Lisa is. You know who Maggie is. You know these characters like the back of your hand. You know what they will and won't do. And to me, that's how continuity informs consistency rather than becomes, you know, the the end all be all. These are, I mean, I I will do my level best not to break continuity if I can help it. I will always go out of my way. And if I if I busting up continuity, it's because I I just 
couldn't find any other way to tell a story. Yeah. Because I do want to honor the work of the people who were here before me, just as I hope that, you know, in, in the future, people will look back on my work or writers will look back on my work and go, okay, there was, you know, there's some cool stuff there that we can use. Um, there, you know, there's a continuity that Mark built that we can use. Uh, so it's nice to leave something behind and I want to honor that, but, but man, yeah, I mean, you, you, at the end of the day, the job is to tell a story. Mm -hmm. But it's also, it's like, you know, I I don't remember who it was. I feel like it was John Lehman, but somebody once told me like continuity is like, what is continuity? But it's, it's like, it's like your life. It's the, the things that have happened in your life and it's the things that happen in those characters' lives. And it seems to me that, you know, you, you're a very, you know, I said this before, you're a character first writer, it, it seems to me. Do you find that regardless you know, this history of the, uh, of the Marvel Universe is, is a really interesting piece for this because it's like, I, I think you're a character first writer, but do you find that that's your approach regardless of the kind of story you're telling? Or does it really depend on the project? Can you not just, you can't just one size fits all every project you take on, I guess. I think it's a hybrid. I mean, I, I, with every project I take on, I just go back to basics. I go back to first principles and go back and look at the earliest work because I'm a big believer in author intent. Sure. And and study that. And, and in a sense, that is continuity. In a sense, that is studying continuity. It's, it's going back and looking at what has happened in the earliest days of these characters to find them so that they, you know, they become household names. They become uh, characters that live on before and after me. So that's, you know, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, a little bit of both? Yeah, 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 yeah totally. Um, no, I mean, I, I just think it's interesting because, like, uh, I, it's always really interesting to look back when I'm prepping for this at, at creators' careers and just kind of seeing what they've done in, like, a totality and, like, seeing kind of your approach. And it, it just always feels like that is that, that is kind of your guiding light. But at the same time, you know, I, this, is, this is kind of a, a random question, but... I, I was when I was looking at what you've done. You know, you did fifty two. You've done. You know, Superman Birthright was obviously a, a big deal. But one thing that you've never really done in terms of like the the old standards for for you know Marvel and DC stuff is you've never written a, in a in a event. A, I'm doing air quotes now. You can see it. Does does that seem like something that just doesn't fit with what? you're interested in? Is that why that's never happened? Or is it just, you were never in a place to do something like that? I actually, there's, I will I take umbrage with your question to some degree. I oh no. My, Did I miss um, something? My tongue, no, tongue, tongue in cheek. Uh, there was underworld unleashed. Oh yes. Yes. Ah, my bad. And, and that, and that was no, it's okay. No, it's okay. It, there were actually, I was, I did two events that I can remember. It was underworld unleashed was one, uh, which was again, uh, you know, very much, what the year of the villain stuff is happening in DC right now. It's, it's the same story, really. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Lex Luthor rather than Neuron coming forth and saying, okay, I'm going to level you up. So it's the same story. Uh, but that was 20 years ago. Uh, the other one was a vanity project. We straight up a vanity project. And, you know, the worst crap I could fall into if I'm trying to distance myself from being, you know, an uh, old fashioned Silver Age guy. And that was, we did an event called the Silver Age at DC, which no one remembers. No one remembers this book. Mm-hmm. Do you remember this? I don't. I remember Underworld Unleashed. I, I have I have that comic, and I guess my brain disconnected that. No, it's perfectly okay. I mean, again, I haven't done one in like 20 years. And I think, it, and also I think, uh, let me follow up on Silver Age real quick, which is that it was a pure vanity project. It was, you know, I don't think it was my idea, but I was the guy who leapt on that grenade fast, which was let's do a story set during Silver Age continuity. And then I just wrote a herd on that we work with Kirk Busiek, Mark Miller, uh, you know, Brent Anderson. Uh, there's, there's so many people, you know, Barry Kitson, uh, so many people worked on these books. It was, it was two bookends and then nine books in between. And I find it unfathomable to this day that DC just won't come anywhere near reprinting it just because of the names that are involved. And in it. it seems like you could, you know, you're leaving money on the table if you're not reprinting something that Mark Millar did. But, mm-hmm. um, Anyway, but that said, to go back to your question, um, I, it's funny you should say that because I was thinking about that the last time I was on a Marvel retreat. I talked to Tom Brevoort about this. I said, you know, we we do talk and event speak all the time now, and that's not a, 
necessarily a bad thing. Some of these are great ideas. I mean, War of the Realms was a terrific story. I thought mm-hmm. Jason Aaron knocked it out of the park. And there's other stuff that's that's happened that's big and gigantic and is really interesting. But I, yeah, I don't, I, I don't. That's not an itch I, I feel like scratching anymore. I mean, 20 years ago maybe, but even 10 years ago maybe. But I don't. I think that's not my wheelhouse anymore. I don't. It's not that I. You know, it's not that I can't have the giant ideas if I sit down hard and think hard enough about it, but the fun of it is the smaller stories. The fun of it is the character stuff mm-hmm. and how the characters react to stuff. And that's, you know, in a perfect world, one issue stories would be the best selling things in comics and I'd be a billionaire. Uh, unfortunately, you know, my approach of smaller stories and, you know, character stuff never really sets the sales charts on fire because it's, you know, the sales, the top slots are always reserved for the big giant happenings, but I've made my peace with this. This is where I, this is what I like doing the, the best. I think this is what I do the best. I also think to a certain degree, there's an inherent tension between, you know, an event comic is kind of like a blockbuster movie. And if you're a person who enjoys writing puzzle box type stories, the puzzle box is not necessarily about showing, 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 and blockbusters are. And so it doesn't seem like, you know, maybe there can be, you know, DC's got Event Le- Leviathan right now, which is very much heavily built around a mystery. So it can be done, but maybe it's a bit more difficult. It is. I mean, Reborn and I talk about this all the time. We, we, you know, I would like to take a swing at it at some point again, you know, while I, while I still have a career, take one more at bat an event, but we keep talking about it and we just can't seem to find anything that really fits my skill sets because we are just, everything is 30 issues long. Everything is 40 issues of tie-ins. And right. it just, it's that again, I, as somebody who enjoys telling the character stuff and starting from character, you know, when you're telling a story, it's like the, the you know, the, the scroll and inv- secret invasion, you're not starting secret invasion with character. <laughs> You're yeah. starting here from a really cool idea. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, let's talk more about let's talk more about my shortcomings. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> no, now we're going to talk about something completely different. I, I you know, I, I, this isn't a shortcoming. This is this is a compliment. I swear. I, I, uh, I think that it's been really, you know, a lot of times when creators have been, you know, when writers have been around for a bit, it can be tough to stay relevant. But I feel like you've been extremely relevant for the entirety of your career, and and. I think part of that might be your curiosity because it seems I was reading another interview where you said that you don't read a lot of superhero comics. Like you read like Chris Ware and Los Bros Hernandez, people who break storytelling, you know, you did thrill bent where you're doing like, you know, digital comics. It seems like a big part about of your interest in like the way you stay relevant probably comes from your curiosity as a storyteller. Do you find that you're, often pursuing different ways to approach stories as a comic because it inspire or you know it inspires you to challenge yourself in different ways oh constantly i mean seriously that's the only joy at this point the only real joy at this point is finding a new way of of doing this or that and again i'm going to learn way more about writing from sitting down and reading berlin cover to cover than i am you know, looking at old Silver Age Green Lantern comics, right? No, to no offense, but it's I'm hungry for new stories. There was what was it the other day? It was a book that I come across, and I immediately tried to figure out some way to do it in comics form because I thought it was brilliant. Which a book that had cutouts in some of the pages that allowed you to see pages that are yet to come. Wow! So you're getting a glimpse of stuff that's going to happen two chapters from now. And there's got to be a way to do that in comics. And I immediately seized on that like a dog on a bone. Mm-hmm. Um, th- that's the kind of stuff that, that that helps me bring the heat. You know, it's like, that's the kind of stuff that makes me interested. And if I can keep doing that, maybe, you know, maybe that's what keeps me relevant. I honestly don't know. Like I said, the, the whole idea of how I stay relevant is is I just don't look down. Because yeah. I'll be like the coyote and I'll just suddenly realize I'm walked off the cliff and I'll fall. So, yeah. But I really do think it really is a matter of you, the, the moment you say any variation of ah, kids today, <laughs> give up, just yeah. stop, you know what, go away, because then you're doomed. If I hear I, every time I hear somebody bitching about how comics today, shut up, just yeah. shut up. things change, people change, taste change, 
Um, you know, and there's something good to be found out there, no matter what. You know, it, it's there's le- it's certainly some level of craft may have been lost over the years, but new things have been brought about. And you know, everybody every time I hear somebody talk about how, you know, you it takes twelve issues to tell Green Lantern's origin when John Brew did it in six. Yeah, you try tell you try selling that six page story today mm-hmm. to a new audience. See how that goes for you. You know, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> Things change. You know, we're not watching everything. We're not watching our TV shows on 12 inch black and white tube anymore either. It's things change, Mr. Scorsese. You know, <laughs> um, things change. I feel like uh, comics has this weird, and maybe it's not just a comics thing, but it often feels like it's in perpetual, like, mourning of itself which is a very strange thing because I don't know. I mean, like 2019, there's so much, there's so many exciting comics coming out. Like, uh, and I'm not, I'm not sure if you're familiar with short box, but I, I short box publishes these, uh, comics. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 And I got the most recent one recently and it had this comic in it by a cartoonist named Lisa Trayman, who actually does animation for Disney. And it was a comic called Minotaur and like inside of it had a fold out map that like oh, cool. inter- integrated with the story. And I was like reading through it and I was just like, all of a sudden there's this map and I was like, I have never seen this before in a comic ever. And it's just here. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, here's the, you know, here's the thing. I mean, you're right about it being a, a self, a self perpetuating morning machine. Um, and it has been since, you know, 1970s. Uh, oh, comics is doomed. And, but what's happening now is the illusion that comics are doomed or comics are down or comics are you know, really hurting. The illusion is that you're looking at that strictly through a superhero prism, right? That yes, you know what? The market for superhero comics is steadily shrinking, but guess what? Raina Telgemeier sells a million damn books a month. You know, she's Raina Telgemeier sold more copies of her books since we've been on the phone then, you know, I'm going to sell of, you know, next month's this or that. Right. Um, and that is a good thing. That is a, you have to keep an open mind. This is a, the medium doesn't have to die. The, the genres will change and superheroes have had a really super long, healthy run and they'll continue to be a, a staple of superhero of, of comic books. I don't think they're going away anywhere, but man, man, we got to get off this notion of comics are dying. no, comics are bigger than ever you're just not looking in the right places Mm -hmm. well you know related to that let's jump into like h1 and ignited because i I think that what everyone over with with humanoids and h1 was trying to do is it's it's really interesting because you know there's obviously a fair amount of publishers who are trying to do superhero or superpower you know related comics but it seems like everything I've read that you're trying to not just do the same thing superhero publishers do every time. Why, you know, like going into that, why was that something you all wanted to avoid? And how do you balance that out with making yourself appealing to a crowded market? Because, you know, there, there, there is a lot going on in, in terms of that, that area of comics these days. Right. Well, to answer the first question, you know, why do I want to set up a hamburger stand between McDonald's and Burger King? Right, right. Uh, they're, you know, Marvel and DC do superheroes better than anybody else. They've always done superheroes better than anybody else. Why on earth do you want to be third place at best? Um, I've no use for that. I'd rather be, I'd rather be first place at something that is a middling hit than, you know, fourth or you know, fifth guy to come along on something that is a, you know, is a big money making smoking hit. Um, that's part of it. The other part of it is, you know, I've, I've again, told every time the superhero story there is, uh, so the conceit of the H1 universe, the conceit of these ignited books and what brings them together is uh, characters have abilities and powers, but there's no capes, no cowls, no super villains, you know, nothing, none of those tropes. We're dealing with characters in a very real world trying to find a way to leverage abilities and powers against you know a, a, a world where there's nobody really to punch right. if you will and i find that an interesting challenge some of that is in the dna of humanoids because you know it's always a, Euro- a european based publishing company and european comics are 
not about superheroes at all. Uh, they're about everything but superheroes. And so some of that was trying to sort of meld the European approach with what what American comics do well, I guess, you know, which is, you know, showy stories with people using superpowers because that's a very visual thing to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I, I, I like that the, the list, the, the people who are working on it, like the architects, which is, uh, you know, Kwanzo Sajefo, uh, you, it's, um, God, uh, John Cassidy, Quiet, Yannick Carla, Paquette, John Cassidy, Carla, and, and Carla, Carla Speed McKeel. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, uh, Carla's, uh, she, she's somebody that's really interesting because I remember the first time I ever read about her was Warren Ellis was doing this column for CBR a long time ago called Come In Alone. And he would sing the praises about Finder f- forever and ever. And it's, I like the fact that, you know, while a lot of these, you know, the people involved are known commodities, each of you has interests outside of just like the super, it's not like you're going to go in and you're like, we want to do the same thing. It's like, John, you know, I know he's done a lot of stuff in like the French market and Yannick, the same thing. Uh, Carla's her, she's never been in that world really. And, and so it's like each of you brings a little different perspective than usual. And I find that to be a really fascinating starting point because it immediately makes you a little bit different than just trying to recreate the Marvel and DC wheel, if we will. Yeah, that was very much by design. And that was and, and all props to Fabrice Sapolsky, who is the uh, Sapolsky. Jesus, I'm, it's my cold. Sorry, Fabrice. Uh, it's Fabrice Sapolsky, who is the editor, you know, working on that stuff and having assembled that team to begin with. So that was really smart of him to pull together. That was a really good brain trust. And still it is. I mean, they still we still communicate. We still chime in uh, on that level. Still hear from those guys. And, you know, especially when we're trying to do new things or launching new books or, you know, what do we do next in terms of, you know, do we want to launch another H1 book? Do we want to do another ignited series? What do we do? Mm -hmm. Related to all this, I I do think it's, you know, jumping in with the H1 stuff is really interesting addition to your career because i mean you've had a very diverse career you're the editor-in-chief at boom you're the you know you're now the director of creative development at humanoids you created thrill bent etc etc do you feel that that's more of a product of opportunity and situations or your own desire to you know it seems like you don't you're never interested in necessarily just being one thing and you've always been interested in that editorial world like do you find that it stems more from that I think that it started as as just basically opportunities in my feet, and it became seeking things out. I mean, remember, I owned a store too. Yeah, yeah. And 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 owning a store was really as much about okay, this is something I haven't done yet than it was anything else. Um, but the idea of somewhere in my head, I think that there must be some sort of unified field theory of comics <laughs> because I've done everything. Yeah. And uh, and I think sit down long enough to put it on paper. I think, you know, maybe there's some wisdom there if I can just dig it out. But yeah, it really, again, 57 years old. I've been doing this since I was 25. Mm-hmm. I desperately, desperately, desperately are looking at, you know, for new challenges at every moment because there's no point in being, you know, in, in having inertia take over and just keep knocking out, you know, flash every month or whatever. Right. You know, after all these years. So. Yeah, that kind of answer your question. I don't know so, if I did. Totally, totally. Yeah. Well, I mean, in in relation to Ignited itself, I mean, I think it, it's a really interesting book. It's it's a good comic, but it's such a challenging one because what if it's a what it's about? You know, it's about high schoolers who gain powers after a shooting in their school, and you know, it, it's it's obviously a tough subject for a lot of reasons, but it's also unfortunately not something that's going away. So it's almost impossible to be able to completely ignore it in fiction. So. Why was that something that you and Kwanzaa and like and Phil like wanted to tell? Like, why was this an appealing challenge to you in terms of you know subject matter and like how you build out a story? Well, I'm I'm a political animal and I'm pretty well outspoken in terms of my beliefs and I you know I think the NRA are a bunch of thugs and uh, the NRA leadership and I think that that. Wayne LaPierre continues to be one of the most dangerous terrorists uh, on domestic soil. Uh, And I've been long in favor of some sort of sensible gun control as has 87% of the country. Mm -hmm. So the great tragedy of these shootings happening over and over and over and over again. uh, I mean, for somebody, for somebody with no kids, it really seems to get to me um, more than a lot of other things. And so when this opportunity came up, 
you know, I, I was on it like black on a bowling ball because this is, it gave me a chance to, to really dig in there, but it would, and it would have been easy to then to make all the kids spokespeople from my point of view or my, you know, my Kwanzaa shared point of view that this is ridiculous. Uh, and instead it forced me to go in there and be like, okay, well, doing the research, you know, not every kid who went through a shooting believes that all guns should be dropped in a volcano. Not every kid believes this or that. And it was quite the education to go in there and talk to a bunch of survivors and talk to kids and, and read and, and do deep diving and realizing that, you know, there's different points of view on how to solve this problem or how to respond to this problem. So I, I love the fact that I'm, you know, I, I came in with an agenda and, uh, you know, I slightly have it. You know, my agenda got modified because it makes for better stories. Yeah. Yeah. I do think it's, it's very important that you, you know, you did what you said, which is you, you read pieces from shooting survivors, you read books related to the subject, and you even talked with survivors and everything. And and that trying to tap into that empathy, the the empathy that comes with that and the understanding that comes with that. Like another thing you guys did that I, I really thought was was excellent was that you included letters from people who went from who went through actual shootings in the issues like the i believe issue four had uh a letter from somebody from columbine and like that's yep it pairing the reality of that with the you know i don't want to say unreality because it's it's very much steeped in the real world but like you know kind of the you know enhanced reality of of ignited it really grounds it and it, it makes it feel a you know, more authentic in it gives it the, the weight it needs for a story with this subject matter. Well, good. Thank you. Because that was, that was the intent. I mean, it, it would have been so easy to be exploitative with the story. Yeah. To have it come across as exploitative and, you know, our radar was up on that from day one. And to, to some extent, it was a matter of, to a large extent, it was a matter of these people deserve a place to talk. These people deserve a forum that have been through this sort of thing. And this is a good forum for them. And and they're welcome to say whatever they want to say. To some extent, it was also keeping us honest. It was also a matter of, Hey, I'm going to show you these books before you write a piece, obviously, because you're going to want to know what you're getting into. Is this legit? Is this, are we being honest? Are we being, uh, you know, are we being on point with this? Does this feel exploitative? And I am you know, happy to say that no one, has come to us on, on any level that I have seen so far and said, you know, you creeps, you know, what right. you doing? you're exploiting the situation. I mean, I'm sure there are people out there who feel that way, but you know, but you know, they're comics gate. So it's okay. real. Yeah. I, I mean, honestly, that, that, that's, it's one of the interesting things about subjects like this because there's really two lines of thought about it. It's like one, you know, there's some subjects you shouldn't tell. You shouldn't write about this because it is it's it's too real almost. But then there's the other th- idea of where you have to confront it in fiction because you need to be reflective of reality and you need to not just bury your head in the sand and pretend like these things don't happen. And it's interesting because it's such a challenge today in like, you know, the social media era where where people always have heightened emotions about everything. It's it's hard to thread that needle. But I don't even know as a storyteller if that's something that you should really even be trying to do. It's it's a it's an yeah, interesting I split. I've given up. Yeah, I've given up trying to thread that needle. I mean, I, I think that I spent you know the first ten years of you know of the twenty first century paying too much attention to the internet and and therefore feeling like I had to thread a needle and I don't care anymore. You know, I mean, I just want to I want to tell. I mean, it doesn't mean I'm not going to screw up. It doesn't mean I'm not going to tell inappropriate stories here and there as I go, because that, yeah, that's just going to happen. But statistically, I'm going to screw up every once in a while, but by and large, you know, I, I don't, I don't care about, Hmm. How do I want to sit, how do I look at this? There is merit to keeping all your political beliefs as a creator to yourself and making your books as, uh, wide appealing as possible. I totally understand why people do that. And it certainly is a ticket to, you know, stardom. It certainly is a ticket to bigger sales. It turns bigger, you know, take it to, to a, a wider fan base. Um, but I don't care. I, I just, I, 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 yes, I want a fan base. It would be nice to have a fan base. Yes. It would be nice to continue to sell comics, but 
I feel like there's an obligation as a storyteller to tell stories that mean something to me and the market will tell me whether or not they're interested. Right. And you know, maybe, maybe, they are, maybe they're not, but I, if I start to presuppose, presuppose what the audience wants or what it's going to tolerate, you know, I have been saying for years, if the audience knew what it wanted, it wouldn't be an audience. Right. I was just going to say, I mean, I, I think that, uh, Trying to give people what they want is pretty much the worst way you can tell an no, interesting story. Doomed. You're completely doomed. That is the dumbest way to try to tell stories. Um, you have to you just write about stuff you're passionate about. You can tell. You can always tell when a writer or a creator, an artist, whatever they're when they're into what they're doing, when they have a passion for what they're doing, because that is an X factor that shines. Even if the work itself is not necessarily top shelf stuff, even if it's not always the, you know, the best crafted work, earnestness is essential Mm -hmm. to, to making it really good and really important. And again, you know, it's all we care about is character. All we care about is, is, you know, is getting our blood up. All we care about is, is the emotional moments of, of a story. And if we don't, care about the character we don't care about who's it's st- you know who's having anything at stake then or who who's solving our problems who who the story's about then it's just a a sudoku puzzle that's all it is i mean it's just you're filling in numbers and who cares yeah i uh this is this is like the world's most unnecessary analogy but i'm gonna do it anyways i i always find that there was this there was this bar that opened up in in anchorage alaska where i live and it was this bar that was trying to capitalize on the fact that dive bars were popular in anchorage and basically, it wanted to be what they were, so it intentionally tried to be a dive bar. And one of the I, I, I facetious, uh, actually, I don't even, I didn't facetiously. I, I my belief is that it failed because you can't try to be something that you're not. And the more it, that that that's the same thing as a storyteller. It's like uh, if like if you tried to write ignited, and if Kwanzaa tried to write ignited, and you tried to make it apolitical, it would be it would. I mean, I don't even know what that would be. I don't even know if that comic would be, be possible. It would be utterly pointless. It would have nothing to say about anything. Exactly. It's, you know, you've got to be, you can always tell the stuff. And it's like this, you know, the stuff that is any good is always going to be the stuff that people working on it are passionate about and feels authentic. You know, Tom Pyre has a brilliant quote and it has less and less relevance every passing year, sadly. Uh, but, you know, he likes saying kids can tell mad from crap, you mm-hmm. know? You know, you can always tell the the real thing. You can sniff it out. And yeah, I don't, if you didn't, if, if Ignited were not a political book, it would be nothing. It would just be, you know, a bunch of people being, you know, all both sidery. Right. You know, all sides are good. All sides are right. All sides have a point of view. Well, no, <laughs> no, this is not really how the world works. And uh, that's baloney. Yeah, Totally. Um, well, I, I wanted to close uh, by by going back to Amazing Heroes in a weird way. You know, you've you've been working in comics for a long time now. You know, mostly as a writer, of course. But you started as somebody who wrote about them. I, I, you've been you've been doing this for a bit. Like, I, I'm I'm curious about your perspective. Like, how you feel about how you feel comics have evolved the most over your career outside of technology and like. I don't know. I mean, it, like, what do you think are the, the most interesting ha- things happening in comics today to you as an, as, as somebody who works in them? Diversity, straight up, flat out inclusivity. I mean, that is the thing. And don't get me wrong. We have a long way to go in terms of, of, you know, making up for years and years and years of white guys telling stories to white kids, uh, white boys. Uh, but that's the biggest thing I've seen. And that's the thing that excites me the most new voices, new, you know, new authentic voices from people that I don't, I don't have your voice. I mean, that's, again, that's one of the reasons I wanted, when I came on ignited, I said, I'm only going to do it. If you, if you team me up with somebody like Kwanzaa, if you team me up with somebody who is not another older white guy, right? Because I, I need, I'm hungry for that voice. And so that to me is the most exciting thing that's happening and it has been happening in comics for a long time is, you know, the, the best work is being done by people who, you know, don't fit the stereotype. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, you, you mentioned Raina earlier, but it is interesting to see 
the books that are doing so well. And it's not, I mean, it's not just young readers, but it, a lot of it is young readers. And a lot of it's by, you know, women, it's by people of color. You know, you find like somebody like Ngozi Okazu who does Check, Please, and that book is a sensation. And it's, I, I just, I love seeing how much it's expanding as like, as the market, as the broader comic book ecosystem kind of starts reaching other places like i think that right. that makes it easier because when you have a place to to publish your book your work and to get discovered that it, it, i don't want to say it makes it more democratic but it makes it easier for you to find a way in yeah exactly the fact that kids you know of all stripes of all you know uh, of all backgrounds can see themselves go to a comic book store and see themselves somewhere on that rack you know, that's invaluable. That is it not just invaluable because it's the right thing to do. It's it's also invaluable because that's how you keep the medium alive. Mm -hmm. That that because the shifting demographics of our country are such that, you know, we're not the majority anymore. And so stop acting like it. Stop, you know, stop catering strictly to us. And I, and I just want to point out that these books that are by diverse voices or by different voices, they sometimes they don't sell very well. But you know what? That is no reason not to do them right. for a couple of reasons. One is that it's ethically and morally the right thing to do. But secondly, even from a business standpoint, the thing that people tend to forget, let's use America as an example. That was a pretty good book. Uh, didn't sell worth a damn at Marvel. Uh, it's about, a, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a non-white, you know, young woman with superpowers. Um, didn't sell terribly well. But you know what? We don't know how important or not important that comic is going to be in the years to come. The example I continue to use is, you know, DC published Green Lantern, Green Arrow back in the 70s. It was a, you know, a very political book by Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams, right? Right. Book lasted 13 issues and was canceled for low sales. But guess what? You know, about 10 years later, they started reprinting that stuff and it has not been out of print since. Mm -hmm. And I challenge you to find me any other things from DC in the early seventies that are still in print and have continued to be in print ever since I, you know, swamp thing is it. And that's about it. Um, you, you never know. You never know what, what you're going to do, what you're doing today, what waves you're going to make tomorrow. So, you know, every time I hear somebody mouth off about, Hey, you know, get woke, go broke. I just, all I think to myself is man, that is some short term thinking. Yeah. You know, it's funny you mentioned that uh, Green Lantern, Green Arrow book, because it's, you know, that that speedy cover is probably one of the most iconic covers that's like ever. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I can have specific. Re I've never even read that comic, if I'm being perfectly honest. And I have exact recall as to what that cover looks like. Yeah, exactly. I warned the junkie. Yep. Yep, exactly. Um, but, uh, you know, I actually I published a feature today on like the the making and uh, like what what made. Uh, the unbeatable Squirrel Girl special, and like that is that is a book that has you know it didn't do super well in the direct market from what I understand, but it, it connected in the Scholastic Book Fair markets. And, yeah, exactly. And and I think that stuff's great. And like the thing that's really interesting about it too is is like I wrote this in, in the piece when it was first announced. I was deeply skeptical of it because. It was a Squirrel Girl book, and for my entire life, Squirrel Girl had been pretty much presented as a gag character. And I'm like, why is this right. character? Why is this happening? And then, then when you actually read the comic, the comic is filled with like nonviolent solutions and like and like outside the box uh, things like that. And and it's it's interesting because it's nothing like I would have ever expected a Marvel comic to ever be, but I think it's reframed what I believe a Marvel comic could be. Yes. Yes. It, it's the, the most maddening thing to me about the last 20 years of comics is that somehow we went from comics are for everybody to comics are for just me. Right. And this makes me mental because you, you've got to be open enough to realize that, just because you don't like something doesn't mean it's not good. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not, I don't like Aretha Franklin's work. That's just a personal thing. But you know what? I recognize that she is a genius. I recognize that she was an, uh, an exemplar, that she was insanely talented. Mm -hmm. It is a matter of taste, but I do not confuse my matter of taste with the qual 
quality of the actual work. And, and we cannot do that. That's that, that creates that infighting where everybody's just bitching about how comics aren't exactly like they were when mommy was still alive. Well, yeah, they're not going to be just grow up and realize that Raina Telgemeier has a place in this industry and that squirrel girl has a place in this industry and America has a place in this industry. And just because it doesn't appeal to you doesn't make it bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, and, and also like it's a lot of the stuff that that people have beef with. It's just like, it is, you know, for me, it's, it's like, I, I look at, I actually, I, I don't know if you've ever read any of Raina's work, but I think Raina is a wonderful yeah. cartoonist, and it's great. Yeah. It's it's interesting because I, I mean, I don't think anybody, I don't know if I've ever seen anybody who has a real beef with anything Raina's done, but for the the vast majority of the stuff that people have beef with, it's 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 impossible to deny that it's competently made, and it's like if you're trying to say otherwise, it mostly just makes you look crazy, and it's it's a really yeah, you, fascinating you, I thing. I dismiss your critic. I dismiss your criticism out of hand immediately. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I don't know. It, it's 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 a it's an interesting time for comics. It kind of always is, I imagine, from your perspective. But Mark, that is all I have for you. Thank you so much for coming on and talking about your career and comics and everything else. No, you asked some very good questions. I very much appreciate them. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Off Panel with writer Mark Wade. You can find his work in the history of the Marvel Universe and Ignited. As a heads up, Off Panel is once again brought to you by Sketch.com. Check out the new version of the site and consider subscribing for access to all the site's con- content and its members only forum. If you're a fan of Off Panel, make sure to check it out on Patreon. If you back the show in there, you not only support it, but you get early access to each week's podcast, access to weekly content, and more. Also, don't forget to subscribe to Off Panel on iTunes or Spotify and give this show a rating or review while you're at it. You can find Off Panel and Sketched on social media by liking on Facebook at slash Sketched, that's S-K-T-C-H-D, following on Twitter at, at SketchComic, or following me at, at SliceFriedGold. Big thanks to all my existing patrons, including Chris Rita, Transmitter Down, Harry Sayer, Bolts Comics and Books, Carl Mizell, Danny Ollie, Paul Salates, Litwin Studios, Akil Wilson, Nathan House, Alex Dimitriopoulos, Terry Dodson, Troy Jeffrey Allen, Leona Kenyus, Keegan Ray, Milton Lawson, Wesley Giff, Sean Kirkham, Harry Small, Alistair Ross, Julio Anta, Brett A. Schmidt, Jason Goodmanson, Paul Reinwan, Connor Farner, Vita Ayala, JDC and Matt Kenyon, Aditya Bidikar, Tara Ferguson, Dave Slusher, WMQ Comics, Akil, Kokachi, Phil White, Ben Becker, John Pinello, Ken Heidelman, Philip Seavey, Al Ewing, Ryan Alcock, Nick Michelin, David Kelly, Robert Wilson IV, Nick Polito, Owen McCree, Brendan Fletcher, Gary Maloney, Jonathan Nilsson, Matthew Groom, Jason Nassi, Adam Bogart, Xavier Files, Matthew Taylor, Tyler Turner, Mick, Nick Patera, Jacob Sorelli, Ford Gilmore, Dave Baraldi, Ira James Udaskin, Modern Magic Stories, Nick Hall, Bjorn Basin, John Hendricks, Steve Anderson, Ian Maxfield, Cliff Chang, Benjamin Shipper, Paul McMahon, Chris Palmer, Scott McGovern, Nathan Fairburn, Kat McKenzie, Greg Rucka, Adam Highfield, Bonus Staples, Chris O'Halloran, Mark Abnett, Mike Murphy, Michael Shirley, Tom Barnett, Jim Demonacos, Norbert, Nick Lowe, James Kaplan, and Mission Comics and Art in San Francisco. You guys are all the best. A quick thanks to Upright T-Rex Music, who wrote and performed Off Panel's theme song just for the show. Check out their music on Spotify because it's completely delightful. Thanks for listening, and tune in next week for another episode.